Hi everyone. Uh, so I hope everyone's doing okay. Uh, this is just uh, kind of a recap quickly of what we talked about in the last video, which was kind of curvature and how it introduces essentially this change. Uh, well, it introduces basically this diffusion and flux of atoms, which changes the size of basically of your 2D grains. So the big recap and what I want you to kind of, uh, the two big equations I think we derived last time was that we have this chemical potential of a sphere is equal to the chemical potential. Again, that's why I have latex notes. Chemical potential of an infinite plate plus or minus two uh, of your grain boundary, so surface tension, your molar volume over R. Or again, you could rewrite this as this chemical potential of a sphere. Sorry again for my. I think you all unfortunately are used to this at this point. Uh, Again, LaTeX, learn it, love it, <laughs> Get, uh, grain boundary, and molar volume here. So, this is your equation for a chemical potential of a sphere in terms of kappa, which is your curvature, which again is going to be plus or minus 2r for a sphere. So, our chemical potential is directly proportional to curvature here. We know that if you have this kind of change in chemical potential, you're going to have, just basically from fixed first law, this driving force due to that change in chemical potential. That will cause a flux of atoms. So, uh, also we said, how do we define where curvature is? Or when it's positive, when it's negative? It's that second derivative. When it's greater than zero, that's going to be positive. When it's less than zero, it's going to be negative. So, where will atoms flow? Well, which has a higher chemical potential? Two, right? Because when I'm sitting right here, that's positive curvature. When I'm sitting over here, negative curvature, you know, because I'll fall down that hill. So atoms are going to move from two to one. And where will the interface move? Atoms are piling up over here, and it's going to push. We're going to push this guy, and it's going to be pulled right towards the center there. So the interface will move basically some distance. It'll move from like here to here, some distance delta x. And we saw last time the other kind of key equation aside from this one was that you have some stress on that interface or on that grain boundary, which is going to be related to, once again, your curvature. So the stress increases as that radius of curvature decreases. So those are the key takeaways from last time. Now we're going to move on to, so we kind of already hinted about this, but uh, Basically, you could think about, or you could justify how those interfaces are going to move and how systems are going to kind of evolve or which, you know, grains are going to grow or shrink multiple ways, right? So we've just kind of looked at it uh, based on chemical potential, this gradient in chemical potential. We've also looked at it with our kind of stress equation. So we've ticked off this one. We've ticked off this one. We could also think about it when you could, uh, we could also justify or think about how those interfaces will move based on fluxes. Uh, so J, so we haven't talked about this yet, but it's pretty relatively straightforward. So you have basically in the notes, again, don't worry too much about read through kind of how you get this definition of the fluxes from one to two and two to one. But we're going to take a little uh, simplified look here. And this is a really, really uh, kind of important graph that you might not have seen before. Uh, hopefully you have, but we're, let's take a look at it right now. This is a very, very important curve. This is the Bell reaction curve. So I, this is super, super, I think at home here, hopefully that'll, sorry, the Bell reaction curve. This is a really, really, really important um, kind of curve, not only in material science, but again, through, you know, engineering is a disciplinary, you know, field is becoming more and more uh, interdisciplinary. Um, the Bell reaction curve will kind of tell you, or it's going to pop up wherever you kind of go uh, in engineering. So. Let's see how we could work and how we could deal with this expression. So the Bell reaction curve is telling you uh, G versus some coordinate. Uh, I have T here, but you could kind of just ignore this. It's basically telling you how easy is it to jump or to kind of move from one area to another. Um, and that's a, a pretty simplified expression. Basically, it's this is an energy landscape. So an energy landscape. And basically what it's describing is how easy is it, in this, in this particular scenario, how easy is it going to be to jump from 2 to 1 versus 1 to 2? So we know, again, this chemical potential of 2 is larger than the chemical potential of 1. So we know that atoms should want to move 2 to 1. So the jump 
or the flux from 2 to 1 should be greater than the flux from 1 to 2, right? I mean, that's just our from, just from this physical intuition right here. So that's what we're kind of anticipating or kind of seeing here. And we could double check and we could actually confirm that uh, on this Bell reaction curve. And again, this is why this is so important. Uh, this curve is so critical and so useful because you see it a lot. Hopefully you've seen this before uh, in chemistry classes in like a catalyst, right? A catalyst, the, you know, why catalysts are important is because they lower the activation energy. So they lower this kind of energy barrier. So there's an energy barrier here, this delta G A, that's like your activation energy. So catalysts will decrease. So any of this delta G, this activation energy, catalysts decrease this, uh, this term and allows it to hop easier. So we'll see that in just a second. So let's look at atoms first going from two to one. So if my atom's here and it wants to hop to one, I just, how, what's, what, what energy barrier do I have to jump over? If I want to hop from here to here, all I have to do is hop all the way to here. After that, again, you're at an unstable point, right? The ball is going to roll down the hill. So if I want to jump from here to here, all I have to do is overcome this energy barrier. That's all the energy I have to overcome. Because once I hop from here to here, then I'm rolling down the hill and now I'm fine. So if I want to jump from two to one, all I have to overcome is this delta G A. That's it. If I have enough energy to make that jump, I will jump from two to one. Now, let's think instead, let me erase here real quick. You guys know the timing issue of this. So now, let's say I want to jump from one, from this well to this well. How high do I have to jump? Is it delta G A anymore? No, I have to jump all this way. I have to jump from here to here. I have to go climb this entire distance here. So to go from one to two, I have to jump over delta G A plus this other term, delta G. This is a tremendous, again, we'll see back when we go back to our notes. This is going to be an incredibly difficult, there's not going to be a lot of jumps occurring here because we have to jump over this additional amount of energy. That is not going to be probable. Again, when we talk about lecture uh, four and diffusion, it's all kind of this probabilistic, like, do you have enough energy? Do you, can you make that jump? Uh, is there enough thermal energy to kind of overcome the energy barrier? This is going to be really, really, really difficult and close to impossible. We're probably going to even neglect uh, the jumps from one to two here. The atoms are going to much, much more frequently want to jump from two to one because so much lower uh, in energy to jump. So you have to jump, to go from one to two, you have to overcome this additional energy barrier here. You're diffusing uphill. We talked about that again in lecture uh, four. So you can go back and read that. So uphill diffusion is not very likely. It's not very favorable at all. So the majority of atoms, thus, you know, if this energy barrier is lower than this energy barrier, we know from diffusion that, you know, diffusion is going to be proportional to this. What type of relationship with temperature? Everyone in my class knows this. Uranius. Yeah, so I, I hear you even... Uh, over the YouTube uh, speaking, you all know this one. So diffusion is correlated to this amount, you know, this delta G here, that's gonna change how your diffusion is. So if this is lower here, it is going to explode, right? Uh, your diffusion is gonna increase dramatically compared to right here. So we'll actually see so more atoms again are gonna flow here, and then the interface will move in. Excellent, so again, You'll see in the problem set uh, that I'll give you basically different kind of all these different weird like curvatures, spots. And if I label, you know, this is X, this is Y here, I could kind of basically give you this Bell reaction curve and you then have to label which is X and which is Y. So here, which has a higher curvature, X or Y? X, right? So X has a higher curvature. So atoms are going to want to flow from where? From here to here, right? Negative curvature, positive, just like the one and the two here. So now they want to flow from X to Y. So you'll do some of that in the problem set. Hopefully it's not too uh, kind of uh, difficult. So you'll see that pop up. So for those of you that love math and who doesn't, uh, so <laughs> I'm not being sarcastic at all about that. Uh, so how do you express this idea quantitatively? Well, this is the flux, the full expression here. So the key aspect 
you could see from two to one, we just have to kind of overcome this energy barrier, that one here. But here, we have to overcome, again, that additional energy barrier right there. We can continue out, uh, again, read through the notes, again, available on the OER, uh, available uh, you know, on the Canvas site, uh, of course, as usual. Uh, you could get, basically, you know, the flux across the grain boundary will just be the difference between those two fluxes. Uh, you could do, again, some additional math, uh, some simplifications, assuming that this is small, and you could get this nicer expression here. Um, but this is great, and we have the flux across the grain boundary, but powerful expression would be if we have, again, two here, one here. We know that the flux of atoms is going to go from here to here. What would be a unique expression and a powerful thing to have is asking, and we know the interface is going to move over here, but what is going to be the velocity at which that interface moves? That would be a powerful expression. We can actually get that from this fluxes because all we have to do is invoke conservation of volume. Again, a lot of derivation here. You could read through that on, uh, kind of at your leisure. But uh, and if you follow through that and follow through with that derivation, what you'll find is you end up with this really, really nice expression here, where the velocity of that interface is related to this factor m. It's a proportionality constant, and it has a lot of factors. We're going to talk about it in just a second. Velocity of the interface is equal to this times the stress, where, again, we know what the stress was, gb times your curvature, right? Again, but uh, a little bit different in here. We use kind of this expression here. That encapsulates it. So don't confuse it like I just tried to <laughs> confuse you with that expression. Here, the stress is uh, kind of this value here, delta GV. So this right here is our stress. And this, everything in here, is our M. So very powerful expression. The velocity of that, uh, that curved interface, how fast will it move from 2 to 1? Well, that is just given by V equals M times this. Now, we are always interested, and this is what I'm talking about when I say, uh, again, the notes and kind of going through the math derivation is not very, you know, again, it's important to learn, but we are material scientists. We are, you know, civil engineers, mechanical engineers, bioengineers. We want to be interested in what are the tunable parameters that are going to allow me to, or, you know, allow us to kind of change how fast that the interface is. You know, if we want our system to evolve quickly, if we want that velocity of the interface to be as large as possible, what can we change in our system in order to increase that velocity, for example. So, stress, delta G, v, delta G bar over V bar, that's not really going to change as much. We can't, you know, that's material properties. So we really can't change this too much. So what we have to look at is M. What in M, written nicer here, can we change? Well, NA is Avogadro's number. We're not going to be able to change that. K is Boltzmann's constant. Again, we could change it to different units, but we're not going to be able to change that as much at all. Molar volume, again, as we mentioned, not really going to change that. Delta GA, we can't really change that too much to, once we choose our material. So A is a constant, T is hopping parameter, N is the number of atoms. Again, not really going to change that too much. So what we're left with, and again, you could cross out that K right here. I'm going to try to do that right now. So what we're left with is this temperature in the denominator and this exponential dependence, this Arrhenius dependence, with temperature here. So temperature is what we can change, what we control. So as you increase temperature, is M going to increase or decrease? Well, if you increase temperature, this is definitely going to increase because this is an exponential, negative exponential. So you're going to increase this factor a lot. But you see the T in the denominator here. Well, if T increases, well, then, you know, you're dividing by a larger value on the denominator. Well, that's going to change, you know, that's going to change M as well. But the key thing is this exponential dependence, right? If we increase T, this is going to increase exponentially, while this denominator is going to increase linearly. So as we increase T, we could change essentially that value of M. Or if we decrease T, we could change the value of M. So temperature is our knob, our control to change. We want A, B to be increase, or we want V to decrease for some reason. We can change T to make that happen. That is our parameter. That is what we can control, temperature. And that will change, again, that is this complex relationship, this exponential, this kind of factor of T over there. But again, that exponential is going to grow faster than that linear dependence. So uh, very similar uh, kind of ideas here. So uh, next time we'll go through uh, 2D grain growth 
and we'll go ahead and get started uh, uh, next time with how do we how do two deed grains scale, and we'll introduce the von Neumann n equals six rule, a really kind of handy and helpful kind of parameter there. So uh, until next time, uh, again, uh, please be safe, be safe uh, and then let me know if you have any questions or if you need any more additional examples. Thanks. Uh, have a good one.